Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, July 28th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, I woke up today thinking, ah, let's talk about money management. And then I'm like, ah, I'm laying in bed going, money management, it's so boring. I don't want to talk about money management. And then I realized that I probably have it uh, – said a lot lately about psychology and I'd rather talk about psychology any day of the week than money management so I got to thinking about it and I came up with there's got to be seven facets of psychology that are that are crucial to your success as, as a trader and each one of those can be explored much much further but I think it's I think it's a good start and of course your questions on trading um, due to like a link issue looks like we have a small audience today which is cool uh, so I don't I don't have to coach too much on how to ask questions so just ask away but usually I ask that you uh, keep the questions to the slides and then ask any other questions you may have and then when we get to the stocks you could ask about as many stocks as you want just ask about them one at a time. In other words, put the symbol in and hit return, and then that way I can get to make sure I get to all of them. And this week's Dave Landers of the Week of Charts is brought to you once again by me. You can get started with my trading service at davelander.com slash trading service. Also, uh, if you want to start following along, and the reason I don't do free trials is, is because – I do a free trial, and I'm like, hey, what'd you think? Oh, I never got around to checking it out. Okay, so I'll give them another one, and then that, that process goes over and over. So finally, just sit down. Forget it. <laughs> if you want, I'll, I'll let you in at an intro rate, but, you, but you're going to have to pay to see what's going on. And once you have skin in the game, then you pay attention. But if you do want to get in for free, then just start on a delayed service, and that will give you a good feel for things. Yeah, you'll be a week or so behind. And, and some people actually signed up for the real service after saying, I actually made money off the delayed, which um, that's not my intention when I put the delayed out, but I'm glad you did. Uh, so that's kind of a cool aspect of it. But anyway, check out the delayed first, and that way you're not going to risk any money either in the markets or um, by paying for the service and you get a feel for things. And I think once you get a feel for things, you'll begin to like it. I like to see me as – part of your staff and and I want to earn my keep as part of your staff and a lot of people are like oh Dave I get it. I'm a go out on my own now it's like no well keep me along you know for the ride because if I could find maybe one idea or one stock that you didn't see or maybe you're not up to 100% someday or don't feel like doing your homework I'll do it for you so I'd like to encourage you to keep me on your staff uh, all predictions are about the future a lot of stuff can happen between now and then as you know you can lose money trading if you want to read the disclaimer screen, it's on my website. It has a bunch of interesting things in it. You know, one day, one day I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to put a bunch of little things in between in the disclaimer, like a closed box before striking in case of rash, discontinue use. If you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast. I'm going to put all those little things in there and see if anybody ever reads it one day. That'd be kind of fun to do. All right, let's uh, stop all the fluff and, and get into the crux of this. The number one psychological thing that I think you need to know is that we're not made to trade. Now, I guess before I get into this, I probably should set it up with occasionally I'll ask my wife what she thinks about my column and, and <laughs> often she'll say, well, you say a lot of the same shit, you know, and it's like, well, I hear you, but you got to realize that as long as people keep making the same mistakes over and over again, I'm going to keep saying the same thing. And if you go back and watch, last week's webinar it might not happen this week because we have a just a, a small living room crowd for some reason um probably because of the link problem but if you go back and watch last week's dave landry's the week of charts you'll notice that i talked about net net and when i talked about net net which believe it or not i'm going to talk about it again this week but when i talked about it i said i know you guys eyes are probably glazing over but you'd be surprised at how many times people forget about net net. And guess what? When we got to the charts, 
on chart after chart after chart, people would say, hey, what about this stock? It's like, well, it's gone sideways for a month or two or three. Never forget about the net net. So that's one reason why you hear me say a lot of the same things. It's like I woke this morning thinking like, what else could I possibly say? I think I've said it all. But sometimes the reiteration of it is what's necessary. It's like the preacher that Anthony Robbins talked about that said the same sermon over and over and over again. And then one of the parishioners went up and said, hey, uh, Reverend, I can't help but notice you're saying the same thing over and over. And he says, yeah, I'm going to keep saying the same thing until you people get it. So my apologies for being redundant here. But the bottom line is we're not made to trade. And humans do not operate very well in an environment where you have no control. When things are unknown, stress tends to rise. When information is uncertain or changing, and I think that's Montier that did some psychological studies on that or was quoting someone, and I'll give him credit. He pointed out that that's when the stress goes up. And in the real world, we're used to having control. But in the trading world, you have no control. And that's difficult for many, especially and obviously the control freak. And guess what? No one knows exactly what a market will do. And that goes for you and it goes for me. And, of course, it goes for the guy who screams on TV. And that's, that's a great thing, okay? When you come to that realization, your life gets a lot easier. When you first start off in this business, you read about all these famous traders and hedge fund managers and everything. And you're like, wow, if only I knew what they knew. Well, they have a little experience. You can't take that away from them. But they don't know exactly what a market will do next. They do get their ass handed to them on occasion. And so will you, by the way. But no one knows exactly where a market will go. I was thinking about that this morning. And it's like I always make the, if I do exactly what a market would do, it would be the last day you ever see my fat ass. And it's not because I don't care about you anymore. I just would be so busy sailing my boat around the world or, uh, you know, helping doing some charity work. Or I would be doing a lot of things and because and I wouldn't have to spend all this time grinding it out day after day after day and I would focus my energies elsewhere, having a little fun, doing a little good, maybe save the world a little bit, okay? So no one knows exactly what a market will do and that's liberating and that's that so much stress. I put so much stress on myself early in my career thinking that if only I could figure out what exactly the market will do. Well, you don't have to. And the beauty of being a trend follower is you just have to follow along. Now, the same things in life that are making you successful could actually be the same things that are hindering, hindering your success, easy for me to say, in the markets. And I thought of a few of these right before I started the show. And there's probably a, a dozen more that I, that I overlooked. But here are some of the main ones. So success in life comes from hard work, comes from taking action, comes from being a go-getter, okay? Very few lazy people are successful. But sometimes in trading, there's nothing to do. Either there's nothing to do because your positions are on and you have to let them do what they're going to do, or there's nothing to do because the conditions aren't conducive to your methodology. We've had a lot of sideways markets over the last couple of years, and, and surprisingly, we've done okay in spite of that, but that's, that's another story. But we did spend a lot of time sitting on my hands, in our, our hands, and I have been almost to a fault so selective in my stock selection, just because conditions aren't conducive. And it's been hard to be that patient. And, and I could see that it's even harder for the average guy out there to be that patient because I'm getting emails after emails. Dave, there's got to be something we could do. We've got to do something. It's like, eh. Sometimes return of capital is more important than return on capital. 
or seeking return on capital, I probably should say. Being right, you're going to be wrong a lot. As I often preach to a point of uh, being redundant, talking about redundant, but being right is a big problem. If you kill half your patients as a doctor, as I often preach, or if half or even one of your bridges falls down as an engineer, you're not going to be an engineer very long. You're not going to be a doctor very long, okay, if you're killing your patients. But in trading, you could be wrong quite often. In fact, depending on the methodology, if you're trying to tr trade for a little bit longer term, you're going to be wrong as much as 80% of the time. And if you're trading my methodology, you're going to be wrong somewhere between uh, 40, 50% of the time. Okay. But you can't worry about being right. Being right and making money are two different things. And everybody's like, Dave, would you present correct? That's like, I don't know. I really don't know. I, if things are going really well, I might be 70 or 80% correct. Okay. Uh, but I'd rather be 30 or 40% correct and make money. But people confuse being right and making money. I could, I could write you a system real quick. Um, I don't know, uh, buy the S&P on the third day it goes down and exit at the first profitable open, okay? Uh, that'll probably work, until it don't at least. And that might be 90% correct. Well, the problem is you're eating like a bird and you're gonna end up pooping like an elephant, the old commodity adage. So you can't focus so much on being right, you have to focus on making money. It's a very process-oriented type of business and, and the doctors that I work with that, that have I pick up the doctors because they seem to be the worst and we're gonna get into attitude is more important than aptitude in a few minutes but doctors seem to be the absolute worst when it comes to trading and they they've forgotten that they spent years and years in medical school and have spent years and years and years getting their experience but one thing that I have been doing lately when I'm talking to the doctors is like, well, is there a procedure? Do you have a procedure when you go to, to a surgery or for diagnosing a patient? And they're, and they're, they're always like, well, absolutely. Well, you have to take a procedure approach to the markets. And it's a, it's more of a procedure than anything else. Um, controlling the situation. Obviously, you can't let somebody bleed out. Obviously, you have to make sure you have the right materials to build the bridge or to repair that automatic transmission. And regardless of what you do, or if you're a manager, you have to make sure the employees are doing a certain thing. You have to have some sort of control. You cannot have chaos. But as we just saw in the markets, or as just said, as I say ad nauseum, you have no control over the situation. Applying logic. I think last week, a week before, I've, I've been putting a lot of my intro slides into this, these presentations. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But the, the main thing that I wanted to, to explain and get the point across, especially when it comes to the newbie, is that, and I'm quoting from Tom McClellan, when you make a trade, you're not only forming a relationship between you and the company and you're expecting the company to do great things, you're also forming a relationship with everyone who bought the stock prior to you. And those people will screw you. And then I went on to say that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And, and I could even quote Tom's mother on that one. Uh, people, some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money and others use far more sophisticated methods. So you have no control over all of those people. But once you begin to realize that, and the market could be illogical, then your life gets a lot easier. Now, the other thing that helps you be successful in life is, ex is experience. And experience is important in trading, but the market will often be a really bad teacher and ironically I've got a, uh, an example of a really bad teacher but the client recognized that uh, it's an email and we'll get to towards the end but the client recognized that he possibly had a bad example to learn from even though 
the bottom line worked out pretty good for him so far. So as far as experience being a bad teacher, if you've been trading for more than a few days, you'll know that the market will often encourage you to take a small profit before it evaporates because you'll make a small gain on a trade, then you watch it disappear, and then you'll make a small gain, and you watch it disappear. And the third, the fourth, the fifth, or the tenth time that happens, you're like, you know what? F this. I'm going to take that small profit. And then what happens? The market takes off shortly thereafter, and you miss the mother of all trades. The market will also teach you to exit at the first signs of adversity. Let's say you got to stop at five points. And the market starts going against you one or two points like five minutes after you get in a trade. So what do you do? It's like, oh, geez, I don't feel like getting stopped out yet again. So what do you do? Well, you exit. And then guess what? Then the market turns right around and goes straight back up. Now, it doesn't always turn right around and go straight back up. Sometimes it'll encourage you to hold on to a losing trade because – Let's say you do get into a losing trade and your stop gets blown by and you decide, well, it's gone so far. Maybe it'll come back and you hold on, you hold on, you hold on. You finally throw in a towel and what happens? Well, the market turns right back around and goes straight up. So you're like, oh, damn it. Now I know the secret to trading. Let's not use stops. So you don't use stops and then guess what? You find out very quickly that'll work until it don't. And there's a plethora of other bad behaviors that a market will encourage you to do. But it will encourage you to often do the wrong thing. Maybe take excessive risk, okay? Maybe not follow your system because it stops working for a while. The list goes on and on and on. And as you get more and more experience trading, you're going to begin to recognize those things that the market is teaching you to do the wrong thing quite often. Uh, the number three thing is it's harder than it looks. On the surface, trading looks pretty darn easy. All you have to do is get on a trend. All you have to do is, is sell higher than you buy. When you're looking at a blank chart, just, just price only on the chart, it looks pretty damn easy. But actually predicting that move and getting on that move and riding that move is, is harder than it looks. Now, the reason I have all you have to do in, is, in quotes is my wife, either she has this overconfidence in me or she tends to just see things on the surface sometimes when it comes to honeydews. And I think that's kind of her way of uh, tricking me into a honeydew. So we we trim some hedges around the house because we let them go for a long time. We probably have no business living in the country with our busy lives, but we are. And uh, sometimes it kind of consumes us a little bit and takes away from, from uh, fun things we'd like to do. But it is kind of nice living out here. I'm watching the chickens um, in the front yard right now as I'm giving this speech. Anyway, so we took a hedge term to the front hedges uh, right in front of the house and zip, 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 10 minutes. It was done. It was beautiful. And then my wife's like, all right, well, let's do the front of the property. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, I kind of groaned a little bit because it's been overgrown for probably 20 years. <laughs> and so every day I did, we had to get this uh, wild hair to reclaim the property. So she's like, well, let's just go, you know, zip, zip, zip is all you got to do. Well, before long, we had to trim some trees, and then I realized that there were two fences behind the uh, the shrubs, which the shrubs were hiding, and they were rotting out. So we ended up ripping those out. Next thing you know, I got a crowbar out. Uh, but chainsaw wasn't working, but I needed a chainsaw to take care of some stuff, so I ended up like using a reciprocating saw, and I ended up clipping all this stuff. And before you knew it, my wife decides, well, let's just go down to ground zero. So we get the truck out, and I'm start. You know, showing my regneck prowess by uh, doing burnouts, pulling out uh, hedges that hadn't been uh, touched in 30, 40 years. So it's always a lot harder than it actually seems on the surface. And that's especially true when it comes to trading. Now, here's the flip side of that. 
I just told you that it's a lot harder than it looks. But what's amazing is people make it a lot harder than it really is. Now, this, this chart I, I made in jest. But I regret, you know, probably at some point I can maybe dig through 100,000 emails or however many I've answered over the years. And I could probably find some, but I've used to, I, I have received charts that look like this. And anyone who is in the educational business or is a public figure in trading has received charts that look like this from, from clients. So I wish I had an original one. This one I actually did make up as a joke. And the reason I put all those indicators on there so you couldn't see the price uh, nearly at all. But I do occasionally, or I have, I should say, received charts like this from people. There's so much crap on the chart that you can't see the underlying security. So it's not as easy as it looks, but it's not as hard as many people try to make it. As I often say, if you can't explain to me a trading system or trading methodology in a cocktail napkin, then toss it out. And in reality, this is pretty much my system. I'm just looking for a trend, looking to get on, on a pullback and placing a stop if I'm wrong. And I guess I should probably add into it. Taking a partial profit and then trailing that stop. So that's pretty much it. But what's amazing is... People try to make it so much more complex than it really has to be. Now, it's taken me a long time. I often talk about the trader's journey where we start adding more and more indicators. Our charts begin to look like that aforementioned chart. And then we start maybe dipping into the complex and arcane, Fibonacci or, or wave counting or something like that, and oscillator after oscillator after oscillator. And then the true enlightenment, as I often say, is when you come back to the beginning. And that's what's been kind of fun about working on this beginner's course. It's, it's a lot more work than I thought it would be. But it's also been just kind of really fun to work on because it makes me think, okay, if I could just find somebody out there who's been doing this for 10 years and struggling, it's like, here, just watch this. It just Because you come back to the beginning. Once you realize that there is no secret and simple, simpler is better than more complex, then your life becomes a lot more easier as a trader. Now, in spite of me putting out the simple system or simple methodology, however you want to look at it, people always come back with, okay, well, I'm working on this system, and it's like, and they're adding in all its complexities, and they want to know what I think, and it's like, well, why don't you follow a simple system first? Okay, write that down. Why don't you follow a simple system first and you're not going to print money with it, but if you could be somewhat successful with it, make a little bit of money at least, then think about adding those complexities. But don't add more and more indicators until you are successful with something much more simpler. So technical analysis leads the way, but it doesn't have to be that technical. And as I often say, preached this last week, I'll preach it again this week, and again, I'm going to keep making the same sermon until you people get it. Net-net price change, the simplest of all indicators, can be quite telling. And you need to ask yourself, is the market higher than it was, is it lower than it was, or is it pretty much about the same? And you must also always remember when you're plotting that 15th oscillator, you're trying to determine if it's a fifth of a third or a third of a fifth, or maybe an extension or a retracement of the extension. Is the market going up, which means there's demand? Is the market going down, which means there is supply? Or is it pretty much just about where it was? Is there equilibrium? Does the demand equal the supply? So you have to always truly ask yourself, what state is the market in? And it might not be what you want it to be, but unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. So 
getting back to the net net, like I said last week, I showed this slide. I'm like, oh, guys, I'm sorry. Your eyes are glazing over. And then what happened? We got to the chart, stock after stock after stock. Yeah, they might have been in a long, long-term uptrend, but over the weeks to months even, they've gone sideways. And we've got a small audience today, so I'm not sure if we'll see that many of them come up. But we have, last week we saw a plethora of stocks. Oh, the room just jumped by about three times. So it looks somebody must have found a link. So again, draw your arrows, but make sure you draw your somewhat shorter term arrows too. And I used to call it the uh, Rip Van Winkle test. Just imagine that you're, you woke up after sleeping for a couple of months and you say, okay, before you go to sleep, where's the stock? $20 a share. Where's the stock now? Yeah, $20 and 10 cents. Oh, so it really hasn't changed. For some reason though, when you're just looking at that chart, you think, oh wow, it's, it's, it's actually going up but you forget about the net net. Now I know I beat the dead horse on that a lot, but it's one of the biggest mistakes that I see and one of the easiest mistakes to fix, okay? So before you send me a chart or ask about a stock, I mean, you could, you could ask about any stock you want, whether it's trending or not, but if you wanna to try to follow the methodology in order to learn, Ask yourself, what's the net net? What's the net net price movement before even thinking about trading the stock or even asking for me to give you my opinion on that? Now, another thing that is vitally important, it's one of my quotes that I often say, is money management will cure a multitude of sins. Now, while working on a slide at the last minute, I got to thinking maybe I need to throw in the caveat, assuming that you are adequately capitalized to begin with. If you go to my website and type in the word psychology in the search, you'll probably get at least 100 articles that I've written or random thoughts, whatever you want to call those columns. And one of them, I talked a lot about being adequately capitalized. You have to sing like you don't need the money, okay? And in order to sing like you don't need the money, you can't need the money, right? Can't need the money? I don't know if that must be the money. It sounds like a rap song, doesn't it? Um, but as I went on, in one of those columns that write, it's like if you need the money to feed Junior or to educate Junior, and you're farting around with that money in the markets, well, you're going to have the wrong mindset to begin with. And you're going to take that small loss because you can't, you can't have Junior going to Yale one week and then community college the next week. Or your kid is going to need to eat tomorrow. He's going to get hungry again, okay, guaranteed. So you got to make sure you have enough money to begin with. Now, once you do have enough money to begin with in your account to trade, as long as you're trading at a proper size and following a strict money management plan, and by the way, garbage in, garbage out. I talk a lot about money management, and, and as I often say, when it comes to trading, it's very hard to talk about the methodology without talking about the mindset. It's very hard to talk about the mindset without talking about money management. So they're all intertwined. So here I'm talking about money management, but garbage in, garbage out. Make sure you're picking the best stocks to begin with. If you get better at understanding markets and your methodology, then you're going to be at better stocks to begin with. Then you're going to have the proper mindset to follow your plan. And in following your plan, you're going to execute that proper money management plan. So it will make it much easier to follow your plan. You get lost, you know, drop an F-bomb. I mean, I do. I, I, I don't throw a monitor around or kick my desk or anything like that. I just I drop an F-bomb and I move on. And I, I have a bad memory on purpose when it comes to stock. I forget about them as quickly as possible so I could focus on the next trade because that will drag you down. But if you're only trading at a small size and you have money you can afford to lose to begin with, then it's much easier to follow your plan. One of the biggest problems that I see, and I've been guilty of in the past, okay, I think the reason I, and I don't want to flatter myself too much, but I think the reason I'm a good teacher is because I struggle too. 
Okay, I don't want to come up here, and, and, and I think everyone struggles. And it's through those struggles, this is kind of like a, um, what word am I looking for? Uh, <laughs> a psychological therapy for me, you know, the teaching. And I think that's why I enjoy teaching so much. But one of the biggest problems that I have seen is that people tend to mentally monetize things, okay? Now, assuming you don't need the money, they see, they see the account up so much and like, you know, I could pay off a credit card or I could, I could uh, pay off my car or whatever with those profits. And they begin to mentally monetize those profits. And that's going to encourage you to take those profits. And people say, you could never go broke taking a profit. Well, bullshit, you can, okay? You can't cut your profits short because you'll never make any real money trading and you'll never pay for the big losses that will occasionally occur that are outside of your risk parameters, okay, uh, a la Talib style, the black swan. But if you're making enough money on the few big trades that do come along, then you can handle those occasional black swan moments and you survive to trade another day. But mentally monetizing profits is a problem. It's a good problem to have if you have profits on the books, but many people try to say, okay, that's enough. And they try to take, they take that 50% profit. Well, if you take profits, as I preach, at 50%, you'll never make 100% on a trade. If you take profits at 100% on a trade, you'll never make 1,000% on a trade. But Dave, how often do you make 1,000%? Well, not that often, but you'll never know and you'll never make a thousand percent on a trade if you quit at hundred uh, percent. If you're following a plan, you know that mentally monetizing your losses. And I think where I'm going with that is, let's say you're risking five points on a trade, and you're down three and a half points. And he's like, ah, screw it. That's that's enough. I'm, I've lost enough. Let's just get out. Um, I remember my father often reminds me of it. We don't really trade much together anymore, but I used to, I used to, um, call him up with trades and he would trade along with me in a lot of things. And I'll never forget. I called him up to short Dell once. And I want to say it was at, it was in the fifties and I had a mental stop at 55. And back then I had a day job and I was calling in, uh, they had an automated quote system that I could call in. So it just looked like I was making a quick phone call and I probably wasn't the best employee in the world. I'm not really proud of that, but, <laughs> uh, that's another story altogether. And I remember I punched in the quote to get the quote and it was 54 and seven eights. And I'm like, you know what? I've lost enough money in this trade. Surely it's going to go up another eighth of a point. Okay. Well, 54 and seven eighths, and it had a stop at 55, middle stop, turned out to be the exact high. And then Dell got into all kinds of trouble afterwards. They were cooking the books and they had all kinds of trouble. And the stock began to implode. And I think it went down to like single digits. And every now and then, my dad would be like, hey, you remember that Dell trade you got me out of? Got me in and out of? It's like, yeah. So if you trade to get the proper size, it will be much easier to avoid that temptation to mentally monetize those profits and losses and just follow the plan. Now, as I often say, it's going to end badly, okay? On every trade, when you buy a pet, it's gonna end badly. George Carlin once said that, and then as I say, when you make a trade, it's going to end badly. Every trade, every trade is going to end badly. Now, I'll just kind of skim over this real quick because I talk about this often. But the first thing that's going to happen is you're either going to flat get stopped out for a loss, and maybe it might be a little bit less than a total loss, but it's a loss nonetheless, okay? Or you might make a little, get that partial profit out, and then get stopped out, okay? And then that's going to make you think, oh, I should have just sold it all to high. Well, if you do that, you'll never catch a trend. 
And then the third thing that's going to happen is in the end, you're going to give up some of that trend. OK, it comes with the territory. So this is actually a good thing to know that it's going to end badly. That's actually liberating. OK, it still sucks when it happens, but knowing that it's going to happen makes it a lot easier to deal with. And number seven is probably the most important one of all. We could probably talk about this one for a long, long time. But your attitude is way more important than your aptitude. I would much rather have someone of average intelligence. Who was it? Eckert or whatever said average intelligence is more than adequate when it comes to trading. Anything more is probably a hindrance. Well, attitude is way more important than your aptitude. I'd rather have someone of somewhat average intelligence who had the right attitude as opposed to a doctor or an engineer or anyone else who was wildly successful in their current or prior career because it's going to be tougher for them not to apply logic not to try to outsmart the markets, okay? Whereas someone of average intelligence, you say, okay, hey, look, it is what it is. It's going up, it's going down, it's going sideways. You want to get in here. You want to check the net net. You want to make sure you just stop in case you're wrong. And if you're looking through all the charts and you see there's a lot of overhead supply just above where your trade is, don't take the trade. And you can give them a general set of rules and guidelines, and they can take the ball and run with it. But the smarter the person is, the more likely they are to, oh, well, I think it's gone down far enough. It's due to reverse. Well, you know that there's a surplus of oil or there's some other fundamental or logical reason why a market should or should not be doing what it's doing. So the distance to your success is often – the distance between your ears, or it is the distance between your ears. Now, one of the things I thought about when I first started working on this uh, intro course I keep talking about, I initially was thinking about, okay, well, you have to know this. You have to know what a tick is, an open, a high, a low, a close. I started thinking about all the mechanics of it. And that's important to know, and you have to know all that. But then I really got to thinking, what's the most important thing to know? And it's like your your mental – approach your mentality is very important and i found this definition that i really like that really applies to what i'm trying to say here is it's a habitual a characteristic mental attitude attitude easy for me to say that determines how you will interpret and respond to situations okay your attitude on how you will interpret and respond to situations okay every trade is going badly how are you going to handle getting stopped out at a flat out loss how are you going to handle making a small profit and letting the rest of it evaporate, okay? And that, that coming out with a small gain overall. And how are you going to handle taking a small profit and then watching the stock continue higher and think, geez, if I left that whole position on, I'd be making a lot more money. And then how are you going to handle in the end when that trade begins to turn on you and you give up a portion of the trade? And one example I often use, I think it was CLDX. One of my favorite examples because it's just such a beautiful setup and a pattern of trend following at its best. But that one position was up 211%. And when it stopped out, it was only up 150 something percent. Okay. Well, 150% is much better than the poke in the eye. And that's where you're going to have to pat yourself on the back and move on. So it's how you, how you see what happens, how you deal with what happens how you interpret and respond to that situation. Like, ah, it sucks. I had to give up some of that trend, but I'm following the process. And now I would like to say next and go on and find the next setup. Now, you know what you're doing wrong? You know what you're doing wrong. And I could talk until I'm blue in, my, blue in the face, and often I do, about net-net, 
not taking stocks with overhead supply, picking the best, leaving the rest, planning to trade, trade to plan, proper money management, and so on and so forth. But you're the only one who could fix these problems. And the beauty is more than likely you know what you're doing wrong. And as I've said a thousand times, when someone doesn't know what they're doing wrong, I take a look at their trades. And usually it comes really quickly to me. Well, you're over trading, you're day trading, you're taking small profits, you're letting this big this big loss here took down your whole portfolio without the big loss, you would have been profitable. Without all these day trades, you would have been profitable. The list goes on and on, but it's pretty obvious when they when they don't tell me what they're doing wrong. And guess what? When I tell them, you know what they say? I know, I know. Sometimes it's kind of like the doctor, doctor, don't do that. You know, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I move my arm this way. It's like, well, don't move your arm that way. Sometimes people email me and say, Dave, I'm not honoring my stop. I'm taking mediocre set setups and I'm taking profits too soon. What should I do? <laughs> stop, honor your stops. Don't take mediocre setups. Okay, it's like my answer becomes pretty damn easy. And it's kind of like the old pogo. It's like we have met the enemy and he is us. And that's I know that quote has been used and abused and overused, but it, it's very relevant to trading. So I let this slide in from a few weeks past. And the bottom line, trading with technical analysis or looking at charts is just the use of charts to read the emotions of others while at the same time embracing your own. And then – I've been kind of noodling with this a little bit. And I need to try to figure out a way to slip a little money management in there. But but the money management kind of uh, confuses the, 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 the um, my intent here. My intent here is that technical analysis is reading psychology. It's reading psychology, but you got to realize that you're one of those participants too. So you have to also embrace your own emotions in the process. Okay, let me look at the um, – let's let's get to your questions before we go – we shift uh, gears and get into um, emails. Okay, Leon, that's a good idea. Send a link out on Twitter. Yeah, usually I put a, a, a newsletter out or what do you call it? Yeah, a newsletter out right before but um, didn't have time today. Psychology is the hardest part of trading by far. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you met the enemy and he is you. It's not sent out this week. Okay. Yeah, there must have been a problem with the go-to webinar um, uh, mailing system or something. Okay. With all the changes you made to your system, you may have dropped from the email update. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to figure out what's going on there. Beer assistant, another brewski. I could use a beer. Yeah. <laughs> I think dieting would be a lot easier if there wasn't if uh, there wasn't beer. But what did Ben Franklin say? Beer is uh, proof that God exists and loves us and wants us to be happy. Matt says hard to sit and wait starting when starting out. Need some kind of income to keep the lights on. He suggests a dealer with that situation. Yeah, get some kind of income to keep the lights on. Uh, for some reason, Matt, I always think you're a programmer. I don't know if I'm, I'm getting you confused with um, with another Matt or not. But but do some programming, okay? Um, you could do something to to keep the lights on. I mean, that's the pressure. You can't put that pressure on yourself. And the marketers out there, or um, it's their fault. I mean, they say like make ten million in ten minutes a day, and that's something that they actually want to be a mail to my clients. I'm like, no, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, because if that's all you had to do, that'd be awesome, you know. But well, markets wouldn't exist because everybody would be doing it, but that's another story altogether. So just put yourself in a situation where you can sing like you don't need the money. And then someone was asking me uh, a, f a few weeks back or a few months back when I was doing a webinar actually for someone else, what do they suggest they do because they have this day job thing or whatever. It's like, well, get up two hours early and, and study the markets in, in those two hours every day. Uh, 
it's hard work, okay? It, it's not nearly as hard as everyone makes, as, as, as people try to make it, but it is hard work. And what I did for a while, and it didn't work out for me because um, for a variety of reasons. One, because other people don't adhere to your schedule, and two, I was probably going to end up being uh, socially awkward if I kept it up. But what I was doing for a while was I would I would stay up all night and work on charts and then go to work. And then I would sleep for a few hours and start the process over again. Well, eventually it, um, it, it began to take its toll on me. I couldn't do that. So instead, just get up a couple hours early uh, or have a job where you could study the markets and still do your job. Um, but make sure you're not doing like I, I know of a doctor who was day trading. He had a laptop he carried around from office to office, and he was day trading while he was treating his patients. Well, he's probably not a good day trader. Well, I know he's not a good day trader, but he's probably not being a good doctor while he's doing that either. Okay, so figure out a way so you could do both. Now, what I often say is with my methodology, busy traders make good traders. If you're off building buildings and growing your empire, then if there's nothing to do in the markets, you're so busy. If there's no opportunities, you're so busy with everything else, then you don't trade and you wait for that opportunity to come along. One of the biggest things that happens if you do drop everything and then focus exclusively on trading, one thing that's going to probably shock you is, as a general statement, your performance will probably go way down because you're going to try to make something happen, okay, as opposed to wait for something happen. Patience is the biggest virtue when it comes to trading and sometimes you just have to wait and again that's why I say busy traders make good traders and I keep myself incredibly busy I'm always working on a course uh, I, I try to fit in a little reading here and there uh, I, I'm newly on my website uh, I, I have so many things outside of trading that keep me busy or even doing research looking at charts okay venturing maybe a two Markets that I haven't really traded much or as much like Forex and and dueling with all these different things and, and doing a little research, looking at a bunch of charts, studying some markets that I might not be familiar with. I keep myself incredibly busy. And if I take a break, I, I there's things to do around here to keep myself incredibly busy. I have a bit of a sickness, and I think we talked about this before. I can't sit still. I have to always be doing something to a point where it's a sickness, okay? And if I'm not moving, I feel like I'm just deteriorating. I actually get, I just get flat out depressed if I am not accomplishing something. So it's like I got to be working on a car. I do work, you know, not that I, I don't like yard work, but it's like, but if, if I'm not doing anything, I'm going to do something and I'm going to keep moving. And that's just how I am. That is very detrimental to trading because I feel like I'll have to do something. So I know myself, you know, I, you, we met the enemy and he's me or he is you, however you want to look at that. He is us, right? So you're going to have to embrace who you are, what you are and, and do that. Now I know you're asking, you know, what do you do if you need the money? Well, you have to put yourself in a position where you don't need the money. You can't, you know, he's asking about generating income from trading. And I think maybe at one point in my career, I thought it could be done, but it really can't because in so-called income producing strategies are dangerous. Uh, I got an email just recently, spam email, and it's like uh, it sets up the scenario. Imagine this. You sell some options for $2,500 and then two weeks, those options expire. You made $2,500. Now, you sell some more options for $2,500, and it's like, that'll work until it don't, okay? Uh, if somebody tells you they have an income-producing strategy in the market, you need to run, not walk away, because if they truly did have an income-producing strategy that was somewhat guaranteed or guaranteed, as they imply, then, number one, keep it for themselves, and think about casinos, which have a half of a percent edge, especially on certain games, and... It's a it's a trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar industry. So there is no edge 
that always works like that. If there was, then somebody would own the market. So be very leery of anything income producing, so-called income producing, okay? I've seen studies that shown the best long-term returns are best if you only buy stocks priced to 10 and 20 dollars a share. What do you think about this as a final qualifier to your exact methodology? Uh, that's, that's tough to say because um, it was, it was, I was in a webinar just yesterday and on a panel and, and we were talking about a stock came up. I recommended a stock that was trading, I think, 40 or $50 a share in, in 1999, and then the next day it went up 58 points. So I think it depends on what time frame you're looking at, and if you have a bear market in between, then your opportunity is going to be in the lower price stocks. But as a general statement, I don't know that that's – I don't know that that's true – and I would be careful in limiting myself to anything like that, okay, because when that big opportunity does come along at a stock that's $21, you're not going to take it, okay? And I think we have one an example. I think the example on this, uh, on this email might be a stock that was over 20 that, that took off. Might be a bad example, though. But, no, I, wouldn't, I, I would not add that in to my system. Leon says, people are desperate to find a guru to tell them what to buy and sell and find it difficult to believe that future is just unknown. Yeah, it's unknown. Now, it doesn't mean that you that you don't have a framework in place. And in my case, I'm looking for quite a few things, okay? And it took me 14 hours in a stock selection course to explain that. But the crux of it is, if the stock looks like an electrocardiogram, it's not a stock that you want to trade. But if it does trade more cleanly, it makes a nice pretty pattern on a chart and it should hit you over the head. It should like jump out at you and with a little experience it will. So you do have a, a process and a methodology that you follow, but as soon as you put that order in, you have given up, given up complete control. So write that down, you know, have a process, but once you put that order in, you have given up complete control of the situation. So, live with it and yes it will end badly hi dave just to let you know your email arrived at 1120 with the link to the webinar i have a gmail account something went wrong i think it's uh, the go to webinar there was a glitch in the go to webinar system so sometimes you'll get an email from me and go to webinar and then uh if i get busy with my slides like today i won't have time to send out that email but what i try to do is it, it should be the same link for every week for the chart show Okay, this causes angst. Stock runs four or five points in the next two days, and it gives it back over the next week. Ouch. Um, I guess that's out of context, but yeah, that's the problem I just identified a few minutes ago. It's like you, you have a nice open profit, and then you watch it evaporate, and it pisses you off. Well, it comes with the territory. Maybe I'm not quite as flippant as I sound. I do cuss and fuss because a lot of people are like, Dave, how can you be so calm? It's like, well, by the time I get through doing my analysis, several hours of analysis every night, I've settled down and said, well, okay, it is what it is. It got stopped out. So what? We gave up some open profits. So what? And you do have to become a little flippant in the way you see things. And just like I said, I often forget about a trade soon after it stops out. How do you know if a strategy is solid or are we just at a time the market conditions are bad? Well, first of all, if you're a trend following, you need to look at the net net of the market. And for instance, the Russell 2000 on a net net basis hasn't done much in a couple of years, two, three years. So if you're trend following and you're struggling, well, you don't have the wind at your back, number one. So that's one way to know. Obviously, um, your profitability or lack thereof will let you know pretty quickly. But if you have something that's viable and conceptually correct longer term, such as trend following, the only way to make money in the market is to capture a trend, no matter what you're doing, okay? Even if you're reversion to the mean trading, you have to capture that that trend. That reversion to the mean is a trend, okay? So if you're trend following, then you have a viable methodology. 
to begin with. But you have to have confidence in that methodology. You have to have – I was thinking about it this morning. I, I have to add it up again. I don't want to exaggerate, but I know it's in the tens of millions. I think I've looked at 20 million charts over my career. And once you do that, once you get that much experience behind you, you see what works, what did, what didn't, then your life becomes a lot easier. And sometimes you just sometimes you know well, who was it Yogi Berra said I'm not a I'm not in a slump I'm just not hitting well you know <laughs> sometimes you're just not hitting well and in that case you don't quit the methodology but you might become more and more selective in what you're doing and you, then you have to work to identify that it's the deliberate practice that I often preach about and Google it if you get a chance I. I I'm trying to think if I have some books here I could recommend on that. Just Google it and read some uh, articles online. But deliberate practice is very important. Read Outliers by Gladwell. Read everything by Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell. And always doing something wrong. Sometimes trades don't work. Yeah, that's right. So the market could be a bad teacher. And we're going to look at an example here. It's kind of interesting. But sometimes you do everything right and still lose money. That's hard for highly motivated and highly educated people because that makes no sense, okay? The last trade with you was June 16th. You should have one triggering today. So your last trade is July 28th. Yeah, that's me, a programmer. Yeah, you know, there's a big demand for programmers out there. So do some programming. And then you might find you, 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 could, you could do both. You could program and you could trade, okay? My uh, foray into this business, I, I got lucky pretty quick. But what I probably should have done to make my transition easier was I probably – should have uh, did contract programming while making the transition over the trading. But I, but I did kind of like uh, rip it off like a band-aid, quit a perfectly good day job with a lot of benefits and dove right in with both feet. Luckily, luckily I got involved with the hedge fund and shortly thereafter I got involved doing some research and I was able to get paid to do what I truly loved and, and wanted to do. But yeah, you might have to do something you don't want to do so you could do the things that you want to do. If you do the things, I, just, I think Zig Ziglar said it once, if you do the things you have to do, you have to do them, you do the things you want to do when you want to do them. Easier said than done. It's August now almost. Yeah, Angela is pointing out that we haven't had a lot of trades. Well, guess what? It's the middle of summer, and usually it's not a good idea to trade in the middle of summer anyway. But there hasn't been a whole lot of trades. Now, we've been, we've been putting up setups, okay? There's been quite a few setups that I've been putting up. And if you start looking at those delayed services, you're going to see stock after stock after stock after stock. But a lot of them, the majority of them did not trigger. And that's okay. I used to feel like I always say, you know, people always like, huh, how come we not always invest in? How come we? It's like, no, you don't always want to be. It's okay to sit on a little cash, especially when the market's trying to find its way, Okay. Now, you could look in hindsight and say, oh, well, the uh, market's higher. It's making new highs. This is we should be all in stocks. Like, no, look at that Brexit slide that just happened. That could have been much worse than it was before. And it was very nice to be able to keep our heads while everyone else was losing theirs. But, yeah, I hear you. Mentally tough not to trade. Craig Watson, get a dog. Yeah, get a dog and have Craig train your dog. Craig's a dog trainer. <laughs> That's a good idea. John says, if you don't keep yourself busy, then start forcing opportunities. Absolutely. You know, you try to, what's the old saying uh, from Market Wizards? They talk about it. Uh, instead of intuition, it's intuition. You know, you start, to, you start to see something that's not there. And that's especially true if you're watching every little tick. And you'll try to make something happen when it's not there. Angela says they have a theoretical income strategy. Yeah, you know, and that stuff will work until it don't. And if you're taking small gains and have huge risk, you know, here's a system for you. Uh, take profits when you're up one point, but risk three points. You're three times more likely to get that one point than you were to get stopped out. Only problem is 
if you get stopped out for three points, then you're going to have to make three trades in a row. Okay? And then if you have three losing trades in a row, then you're going to have to make ten trades in a row to get back to break even. Or 11. I have to do my math on that. Okay? So 10 or 11 trades. And then let's say that you get whacked for, like, say, 10 points. So now you're going to make, like, 20, 30 trades or whatever. So there's a trade-off in trading. You could risk a lot and make a little and be super accurate, and that'll work until it don't. And, and people – there's not enough people out there explaining how this shit really works. Pardon my French for you ladies in here. Craig says, you could trade around position two. Absolutely. Yeah, sometimes you have – um. And I'm not sure what Craig's – I'll have to read the rest of Craig's post. But, yeah, sometimes you do get a swing trade in a, in a stock that you're already in. We're going a little long today. But, yeah, I hear you. I mean, and that's something that I don't actually I don't actually recommend uh, officially to do that. But let's say you're long a stock and then it sets up again. You could absolutely put more shares on and flip some out. See the YouTubes. I talk uh, I talk a lot about that in the week, in the week of charts. So maybe – Go to my channel and Google swing trading around positions. Absolutely. Uh, you can trade around position two, leave the base position on, but leave the option open for ogres, gaps, etc. Yeah, I mean, you could. there's some S&G type of trades you could do, like open a gap reversals and stuff like that. That's not going to be your bet, bread and butter, but you can pick up a little money. What does Linda Rasky say? It's you have a pizza party. You know, it's make enough money to have a pizza party. And it does kind of keep you a little busy in there, but be careful not to get too far into that, okay? Dave, you often talked about deeper pullbacks and getting ready for these. Seems like the golds make a really quick pullbacks. CS, GSS, IAG, thoughts on these, and would be we have entered these in a pullback and not deep enough. Yeah, um, we can look at that. I'll leave that one open. Talent is overrated is a good book. Yeah, I have that book here. I was told uh, don't bother reading it because it's um, – it's just like Outliers and all those other books out there. And then I felt kind of guilty for, for repeating that, that uh, opinion from someone. So I have that book here somewhere. But absolutely, talent is overrated. And um, now I think Mr. Jobs is pretty extraordinary. But one thing that he said that struck a chord with me is that you're going to find that highly successful people, once you actually get to know them, they're really pretty average. Okay. So I think an average person – could learn. I think anyone who really wants to be successful trading can learn how to trade with one caveat, provided that they want to. Okay. Well, you would think everyone wants to. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, that's the psychology, the deep in the psychology that I, I don't, I don't know how to approach that. I don't know how to get into that. Maybe some, maybe an actual psychologist could help me understand that part too. But I do see people make the same mistakes over and over again. Again, like Livermore said, sometimes people make mistakes and know they are making them. And they don't seem to want to change their behavior. So that I can't figure out. I don't – that I don't understand. So provided that you want to, okay, I can tell them don't do that. And then they're like, Dave, I'm along for the ride. And then they're, they're taking – they're taking the best setups, and then as soon as it gets kind of quiet, like Angelo pointed out in more recent times, what do they do? Well, at least they go back to day trading. All these bad habits uh, come into play. They try to catch bottoms. They try to catch tops, et cetera. How do you log into delayed service? If you go to my website under – I think it's under getting started – and then you should get a log on. If you if you haven't uh, gotten a log on, then it's um then it might have gone to spam or something like that. I'll pull that up real quick, and then we'll get to this. Uh, we'll jump to the charts here in just one second. So if you come right here, let's get started. And then I give you a list of things to do to get started. And somewhere in here, you're going to have uh, delayed service right here. And you should get uh, email automatically email, uh, delivered to your inbox with the log on. And if you sign up 
for it before you didn't get to either sign up again or let me know and I'll get it to you. Trading around a position also works until it does it. Well, yeah, you could, you could obviously, yeah, every trade works until it doesn't. Okay. Um, and every trade ends badly, but yeah, sometimes you're trading around a position and it doesn't work out, but let's say you are up 150%, like I mentioned earlier, and it sets up again and you lose a little bit on that, that add on trade. Well, net net, you still did pretty good overall. And maybe if you'd have picked up a few um, trades along the way, you ended up doing quite well. Unfortunately, there's no guarantees. As I wrote a while back, you want to guarantee by a toaster. People want something. People want something else. To, people want someone else to do it. I could literally watch their eyes gloss over when trading is brought up. Well, you probably learn, you probably know more about trading psychology and psychology. Well, you probably know more about psychology of people than the mortal man. Craig trains dogs and Craig often emailed me and emails me and says, uh, say, Dave, it's like all dogs have these inherent characteristics. You know, it's like, it's not like one dog doesn't act like a cat or a kangaroo or a monkey, all dogs tend to have a certain characteristic. And the, the variable, okay, what do you call it? The independent variable, dependent variable? I'm digging myself a hole here. But the variable, Craig says, is the trainer. So Craig doesn't train dogs. Craig trains people. And the dogs just happen to <laughs> learn in the process or not. You did squirrel away some nuts early this year to use now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We had we had a few good trades early this year, and things worked out pretty good. And it's killing me, too. It's killing me. I'd love to just be able to print some money and put on a bunch of trades and, and, and for ego purposes, for monetary purposes. Uh, I'd like to build my client base up and the service and all, and, it, and that obviously happens when, when we start print, go through that print money phase. But it's really been a lesson in patience, and it's really been a lesson in, in just sticking to it. And it's tough. Having a qualified strategy that has worked well over a long period of time can go a long way to give the person the confidence to follow the strategy through good times and bad. Absolutely. We're still beating the market, Dave. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it makes it pretty easy. You know, what what sucks is when you have, I want to say, was it 2013? I, I kind of forget exact years and when things happen. But it, it sucks when you have a market that goes up quite, like, let's say you have a market goes up 15%, but it dropped 20 or 30% somewhere in between. <laughs> you know, it did that two or three times. It looks like a ledge card grand, but at the end of the year, it's higher. That's a hard market to beat as a trend follower. But as long as the market's just kind of plodding around, not setting the world on fire, even when it's going sideways, not always, but even when it's going sideways, if you're picking your spots very carefully and, and only trading those emerging trends in sectors or established trends in sectors and sitting on your hands a lot, then that market is, I'm not going to say easy to beat, but sometimes a little easier to beat than one that just whipsaws back and forth. The secret is a positive expectancy. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, uh, let me get through this uh, email real quick. Dave, for tomorrow's show, please cover Sky People Fruit Juice with a shout-out from Guatemala for you. Also, if you miss also if you miss a stop at ACII due to travel and no internet, what do I do? Praise the gods or scold myself for not following the plan. I was rewarded for not following the plan. Well, James answered his own email. And this is one that we had on the service uh, not too long ago as an IPO and I think it triggered somewhere around here and by the way that's a test of it look at that trade instantly went against you okay but then it took off so I think we got a little profit out of this one and then we scratched out somewhere in here it happens okay but it turned around and straight back up now Craig I'm sorry James is now up about a hundred percent or more on this trade he said should he congratulate himself or beat himself up well don't be angry if you made money sometimes you get lucky okay and you made money you make money on a trade even if you did the wrong thing but the the teachable moment here is if your stop is here and you get stopped out 
or your stop is hit and you decide not to honor your stop and the market comes back, do not reward yourself for bad behavior. Just chalk it up to luck, okay? So he's saying, praise the gods, I scold myself. Well, you could do both, okay? Don't, don't read too much into it. Just say, oh, okay. I didn't honor my plan. I should have honored my plan, but it worked out nicely for me. But in the future, I'm going to honor my plan, knowing that it won't always work out nicely for me. The other one he asked about was Sky People fruit juice. First of all, my methodology is not a be-all and all. And you have to realize with any methodology, or even if you're following many methodologies, you can't kiss all the women. Okay, so what you need to do, though, when you're looking through your charts, if you see a huge move, you need to ask yourself, self, could my system, could my methodology have caught this move? Should my methodology have caught this move? And that's probably more importantly, more important. Should my methodology have caught this move? And if you answer yes to that, then guess what? Well, that's a little painful lesson in deliberate practice. You study the chart carefully, and the next time that happens, then you'll be ready. Now, in this particular case, one thing to point out, this is a very super, super thin stock. And one thing that was kind of interesting is you can see like they went days and days, probably without even a trade in here. One thing kind of interesting that I picked up, I, I picked this up empirically from looking at a bunch of charts, looking at a bunch of thin charts that really don't adhere to any pattern whatsoever. And then it's funny, like down the road, you get confirmation. I think it was Greg Morris said, Technical analysis only works if you have a representative sample, okay, or a sample large enough to be considered a representative sample. So I do like to trade thinner stocks within reason, but you got to realize if you get into a very thin stock, there might not be enough players to have the technical analysis work, the psychology, the overall psychology of the market work, and hopefully that makes sense. So technical analysis works, but the market has to have enough players to make it work. Now, in a case like this, the stock jumped like 100% overnight, okay? So you can't jump into the stock just because it took off 100% overnight. I'm sure there was a bow tie or something in here, but, but don't do that. Don't start trading thin stocks, penny stocks, when they jump, like make these huge jumps. Um, I th think the reason James might have, been looking at this stock. He might have been, I think he was recently watching my stock selection webinar. And basically in that, I said that an inefficient stock can make a larger move than an efficient stock. So, and I actually used, I said, Sky People Fruit Juice could probably make a bigger inefficient move than something like PepsiCo. And as you can see here, the stock went up 20,000% or whatever it was. What's that? Can somebody do the math on that? If something goes from, uh, let's say, one dollar to twenty, is that twenty thousand percent or two thousand percent? Two thousand percent. Anyway, well, this is not a tradable move. And the other thing too, and this is something I actually talked about in that in that uh, seminar. This is what I call a bottle rocket. If a stock goes straight up like this, it tends to fizzle out quickly, and then notice that it's already lost. 60 70 percent of its value so you just you, you just have to let these go and this is not a tradable stock okay all right all right let's take a look at the overall market this this slide was in from last week um some of the things that i've been concerned about are still concerns uh the market is overbought there is some overhead supply etc and we'll take a look at that in just one second. All right. Let's take a look at the market real quick and then uh, keep those. Uh, feel free to ask about individual stocks now. And then, uh, John, you're next. We'll answer your question first and then we'll get to everyone else. Okay. Uh, overall market, peas. Losing a little steam in here. 
Kind of trading sideways. What's that net net thing I talk about? So we're going sideways for a couple of weeks. We did go straight up. The good news is that it is consolidating and it's kind of holding these levels. And the longer it can hold its levels, then this will become the new uh, equilibrium point for the market. So that overbought condition will get walked off. One thing that has me concerned, as I've been preaching about, is that if we correct in here, it wouldn't take that much of a slide to put us back in the soup. And if we got back in the soup, what would the problem be? Well, we'd have this net net problem where we, we'd actually be down for a couple of years in the market, okay, or at least a year and a half. So that's my main concern here. But there's always something to worry about. As a general statement, the market continues to improve. And I'm liking it better now than I did a few days ago or even a week ago because as long as it can continue to trade sideways, the longer it just kind of – this becomes the new – I don't know what word to use for this uh, – resting heartbeat for the market or whatever, this new area, new value zone, equilibrium zone, whatever, then – maybe we can mount a new leg on top of it. So this overbought situation gets walked off and that becomes the new normal up here. Now as that composite, I was a little concerned because it was kind of drifting in here, losing a little steam, but it did kind of pop higher. As I often preach, you don't want to see a market do this, go higher and then kind of drift off. If anything, a pullback is, is more productive. The good news is so far it's plowing through this overhead supply like butter. But it's very important to clear that overhead supply and then some. And the reason is that, again, what is technical analysis? Reading the psychology of the market at the same time controlling your own. Those people who bought the market in that zone, let's say somewhere between 5,000 and 5,100, as long as that market keeps going higher, they're going to get their money back. Okay. But if that market begins to implode again, they're going to see their money erode. I just wrote an article for Proactive Trader Magazine. I do occasional, uh, they have the, the how I see it column. And I pointed out the fact that the market had improved quite a bit as of late. And we completely erased the Brexit slide. And that was a good thing. My only concern was, though, vis-a-vis -vis the Brexit thing, is that showed how vulnerable this market is. It began to implode overnight on a little bit of bad news. Now, it was able to shrug it off. That's a positive thing. But one has to wonder, what's the next shoe to drop? And usually, as, as many have pointed out, and, and I fully agree, it's not what you know that's going to happen that kills you. It's what you don't know. So it's when you get blindsided by something in the markets. But it does show how vulnerable this market could be. Okay. Uh, what else I want to show? Oh, uh, Russell 2000. It's kind of like the NASDAQ a little bit. It did consolidate a little bit. It did push a little bit higher, but it's got a lot more overhead supply to overcome. So this still remains a concern to me, but one day at a time. For the most part, most sectors are improving in here. Uh, some areas kind of stick out like uh, electronics, semiconductors in here. They've kind of melted straight up. Now, this type of move is hard to sustain. So we'll have to see what happens after the correction. But so far, so good there. Um, gold, I've been a bull on gold. Nice little rally in gold uh, today, notwithstanding, but looking pretty good. Gold, the commodity, looking pretty good. If you go after a GLD or a CEF, uh, so far, trying to rally out of a pullback, again, today, notwithstanding, but looking pretty good in general. And then, uh, for the most part, most areas look pretty good. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. Well, first of all, oil. Oil is a bit of a bummer because oil has rolled back over. Now, as I said in the market in a minute, this still could be the mother of all bottoms, but it might come down here and become like a double bottom, and then it might be worth a shot some other day. But now it looks like oil is no longer working in here, so we're just going to have to sit tight and wait for the next, uh, next bottom to occur here and not try to anticipate it. And energy stocks are kind of reflecting that a little bit, although they've kind of hung in there a little bit better. But you can see they pull back into their prior base. So now what we need to do, look at that. No progress in three months, exactly almost. So now what we have to do with the energy stocks is let them break out of this base again. If you're still long from this uh, transition back here, then stay long and obviously trail that stop and, and honor that stop. But if you're not long, 
wait for it to break out back in, then look to play the pullback. Okay. Uh, pennies off trigger. I can't. Uh, I can't comment on anything that's at or around the trigger at this point, Angelo. We could talk about it next week. Um, okay. So as a general statement, market improving. Uh, some of these areas like drugs breaking out of their sideways range in here, so that's a good thing. Some areas like health services, not too far from all-time highs, uh, doing okay in here. So as a general statement, things are improving, and it's good to see this technology uh, it brought our base. It's good to see the Russell doing pretty good in here, the broad-based market doing better, improving, and it's good to see technology such as semiconductors breaking out to new highs. Okay. All right, uh, Dave says, uh, John says, you often talk about deeper pullbacks and getting ready for these. Seems like the goals are really quick pullbacks. GSS, IAG, thoughts on these? And would be have would you have entered these in pullback where they're not deep enough? Also curious about your opinion on CI. Looks like a nice bull flag. Okay, uh, the goals have been tough to get on because they haven't really, um, they kind of took off and then they kind of drifted and they kind of took off and then they kind of came back in. So they've been kind of all over the place. Commodities, commodity based stocks, because they're based on efficient markets. OK, commodities are efficient because they're based on the efficient markets can be hard to trade, can be choppy, can be hard to get on those trends. They still trend on occasion, but it's harder to get in and hard to hang on. So and that's one of the problems we've had. The gold ideally. Uh, you do want to wait for somewhat of a deeper pullback, depending on the magnitude of the move. So if something goes up like this, you want a deeper pullback uh, because you want it to correct some of this trend. You want to have knocked out some of the people who are in this prior trend. So, yeah, that has been a problem, uh, John, with the gold stocks. Absolutely. And I'm not – did I fully answer your question? If not, we'll uh, – and you want to look at CI in the process? Uh, no, I don't like CI. CI. Um, it's just kind of a all over the place. It's electrocardiogram. Uh, no, I don't think that that will be worth a worth a shot. You know, dig within healthcare plans if you like healthcare, and there's probably something that's a little bit more cleaner. Maybe not. And this might well. This is looks a little bit better, but let's see if we got anything else in here. Uh, yeah, United Health. Uh, you know, go after something like that. Uh, although, look at the the HV is too low probably for me to go after, but at least it's trending higher as opposed to uh, Cigna, which is kind of all over the place. I mean, I hear you. It took off recently, now it's pulling back, but it's just all over the place. So let's pass on that one. Transports, the trannies. What's the uh, – isn't there an ETF for transports? Let's take a look at the uh, – IYT. We could take a look at the morning store industry group. Uh, transports have been kind of lagging at least longer term, but they're all over the place. OK, now net 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 net. You have to ask yourself self self. Uh, what have they done net net? They're down like 12 percent of the last couple of years and a half. So that's certainly not an uptrend, but they're just kind of all over the place. So I wouldn't read too much into the transports. ASA for breadth is going to be a gold company. South Africa, I think. Yeah, you know, here's a case where that's not a perfect example, but you did have the pullback here. It was quite a few days of the pullback, and then it's beginning to take off, come back in a little bit. Um, try to find something that 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 hasn't triggered just yet in in the golds. Okay, EXK is going to be a silver stock for John. Yeah, see that one kind of pulled back to its prior little breakout. Again, these these are hard to get on if you're looking for that somewhat of a more perfect pattern. Uh, what was it? IAU. Somebody mentioned earlier. This was one. Was it IAU? No, that's an ETF. Uh, I forget which. One, I already deleted it. Sorry. Uh, it'll come back to me. AXTI. AXTI was on the service. Oh no, I'm thinking of another one. I'm thinking of AXGN. Um, no, it's all over the place, Andre. Uh, you had this huge wide range bar here that you had this upward drift. It's just all over the place. Now it worked, but that doesn't mean that's a tradable pattern. Okay. HMY. That's going to be Harmony Gold. Um, no, again, it's pulled back to its prior little breakout. So as we said a few weeks ago, it would have to break out decisively and then pull back. CDE, this would be a uh, cores or whatever. 
Um, yeah, somebody was asking me earlier about that. The, this is this is not actually a big enough big enough knockout move for me to get excited about, but it took off nonetheless. And that's sometimes that's the hard part with the goals and the silvers. GSS. A couple of people asking about that one. GSS. Yeah, you see, it took off and it came all the way back in below its breakout level. So that's that's hard to get on. It's also a penny stock, but that's another story. TGT. You know, I went to Target once and I missed. Um, that's kind of all over the place. Um, yeah, it's, there's really no structure here. It looks like it looks like it's trying to work its way back higher, but you got overhead supply. It's all over the place. Um, electric cardiogram longer term. Stay away from that one. IAG is the one I'm thinking about. Thank you. Yeah, IAG was one that, and you know, here's here's the pain in the ass. Here, this was one that was in the service and then I took it out because it didn't trigger. Uh, and then it's already doubled in value or, or whatever, nearly doubled in value, I, I should say. And I know some of you guys took it anyway and, and God bless you. Cause it, you know, in hindsight it still didn't look that bad, but it, it no longer fit the methodology. And sometimes that's a tough part is, is saying, okay, I'm following my methodology. This one no longer fits. Am I going to make an exception or am I going to, or am I going to pass? If you make too many exceptions, then you probably need to change your methodology. So for the most part, you want to try to follow that methodology, and an exception should be just that. An exception should be something that happens every now and then where you bend the rules a little bit, okay? And again, if you're making too many exceptions, then then maybe you need to really think about changing your methodology. But I only like a few days of pullbacks in some of these new trends, these emerging trends. I don't like to see months and months or weeks and weeks of pullback. But in this particular case, it really didn't do anything wrong. I bet if you look at like a, a weekly chart or a two-day chart maybe or a three-day chart, it probably looks a little bit cleaner, okay? So you can see it took off, and it really didn't pull back that much, okay? But it no longer fit the methodology, so I had to let it go. EXAS. Yeah, we've talked enough about the transports, I think, for now, Howard. But thank you on that one. DJT. Um, as I said recently, I didn't like the gap down here. Now we got a gap up. This is this is a stock that's kind of hard to deal with, hard to trade. People often say exactly how far back does overhead supply matter? And it's like, well, it depends. In this particular case, this stock's going to have a hard time getting through the overhead supply. So it's too much of electrocardiogram longer term. I don't like the gap. Too much overhead supply. Goro. Goro is one I've been watching. Um, and you could see, boy, it's all kind of messed up in here. Let's clean it up a little bit. You could see it took off and pulled back. I mean, as someone was asking earlier, how deep should it pull back? Well, ideally, I'd like to see a pullback to about right, eh, maybe at least 450 or so, just to make sure you got a good knockout of this, this prior little base breakout. But the golds are a little bit tougher to trade, and you can you can bend the rules a little bit. Chuba, is that that's not a real stock, is it? Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, IPO. Um, it it may, as I said in the IPO course, something that makes the new high. I'm sorry. The um, what you're looking at the buy at B pattern without giving the pattern away. I guess I should put the course on sale. Uh, maybe I'll do that today. But when you're trading the buy at B pattern, if your uh, an initial range, if the high is set for the five day range on the first day of trading, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, then you have to apply the other rules to that. So yeah, it could work, but um, rewatch the course and use those rules on that. TPIC on the first pullback, TPIC. Yeah, I mean, that's what's pretty amazing is that I keep thinking that this IPO bull market's going to end, and I keep thinking, oh, I'd, I'd like to do a service. I'm doing the work anyway. But I've been thinking that for two, three years, and every time I think it's going to end, it goes on. So I guess the day I put a service out is going to be the day it ends. <laughs> yeah, I don't like VNR anymore. That's when I was talking about. Shorter term looks okay. Um, 
I mean, I guess it's all right, but it's kind of bottomed out, and and now you're getting quite a few days of the pullback. I mean, it looks okay. I still think a bottom is in place, but uh, I've taken it off my radar. But I don't know. I guess in hindsight, uh, or looking back at it again, I should say, it still looks okay. It is still a bow tie. It is still off of major lows. A uh, little bit on the volatile side, so be super duper careful. And it has a lot of overhead supply to deal with. But some of that supply is far enough away to where it could still be a viable trade. Uh, just very volatile, okay? Um, if you did take the trade, just use a, use a two-point stop, okay? Or use a $1.77 stop. How's that? <laughs> be prepared for it to go to zero is what I'm trying to say, making a joke. LN, is that LN or IN? Is that LinkedIn? No, Line Corporation. Uh, this is a great example of why you do not buy an IPO when they first come out, okay? If they're priced too high, they will die. That's the uh, Johnny Cochran School of IPOs. <laughs> Chewbacca theory, A-H-G-B. Anybody know what that is? If you have a teenager, you do. What time will you be home tonight? Well, we're going on. What time will you be home tonight? Well, we're going here. HP, a little on the thin side. Metals and mining and center right sector. Nice little trend. Uh, need a little, little bit of a knockout move, though, before you want to get on that one. But, yeah, put that on your radar. Absolutely. Uh, Don VGC might be one I'm thinking about. Uh, this one has caught my eye quite a bit recently. Uh, super duper volatile, but it did make kind of a deep retrace. Now, notice it's quite a few bars in that pullback. Uh, I would leave it alone just because it's too crazy. But, yeah, it did catch my eye. As it's certainly a thrust at a pullback, but the problem is uh, it's just too much. It went from 60 cents to 2 bucks, so it's dangerous, too dangerous to trade. IBB at 200 SMA, first time since 2016. Yeah, it looks like these biotechs have bottomed out in here. Um, I prefer if they were coming off of like 10-year lows, but I hear you. And he's saying that it's uh, penetrating the 200-day moving average. So that's certainly a, a good thing. Is that a 200? Yeah. So, yeah, that's certainly a good thing. You know, it always kind of amazes me, something as simple as a 200-day moving average in daylight can keep you on the right side of the market. Daylight meaning lows are greater than the moving average. So I wouldn't trade this mechanically, but I would say, okay, if the IBB is below the 200-day moving average, I want to either be shorting biotechs or out of biotechs. If the IBB is above the 200-day moving average, I do not want to be shorting biotechs, and I might want to be thinking about being long biotechs. So, Again, a little bit more of a trading system than just that, but it certainly it certainly helps you out, or help it will help to keep you on the right side of the market. Okay, we need to go into a lightning round here. We're actually out of time, but let's just do a few real quick. YRD for Arsity. Um, there's a bad tick in here that always messes this chart up. Yeah, so far so good on a pullback. Put that on your watch list. Absolutely, it looks pretty good. OR. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to do with this one. It's, it's the charts messed up on this one. So, uh, and it's real thin. That's too thin. So leave that one alone. I could pull it up on stock charts, maybe.com and see what's happening. But okay. You're long this one. Yeah. If you're long, this one stay long, but it's kind of all over the place. I hear you. Okay. Well, we better wrap things up. Uh, we're out of time. I appreciate you guys uh, taking time in your business schedule to be here. Sorry about the link issue. We'll try to get that fixed. But I will begin processing. As soon as I hang up here, I'll start processing, and we'll get it up on YouTube as soon as possible. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing up again. Uh, any unanswered questions, daviddavelander.com. If we don't talk between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.